say. <laughs> All right. You know, I mean, I do understand what you're saying. There should be should there? Yeah. Well, okay, if that's the case then, so I'm saying that there should be three PCs. Um, you know, I had this discussion recently about... I know. Oh, no. Oh. Oh, no. Okay. So, <laughs> duct tape here. Um, so, uh, we had this discussion recently about... Uh, I, we, people. Uh, you know, about, uh, uh, you know, say in New York, there's all this terrific criticism. And I would, I would critique the criticism that's in places like New York or London and say that a lot of what we see in other cities, there's a lot of it, um, but uh, I wonder how much of it tends to be more of the gossipy side, you know, and how much of it tends to sort of pander, you know. I mean, and uh, there's been a lot of discussion lately about, um, you know, what sells. I mean, because this is not a foundation. Um, BEZ is a public radio station. It, you know, it relies heavily, of course, on member support. And I'd like to know who's a member. Who's, who's got a member card? Yes. All right. Okay. But um, oh, yeah. all right. Good. But we will look for that. Okay. You know, I mean, because a lot of it is then it, it's all it does all go back around. Is that you know, do we get what we deserve? Um, do we get what? If we, if we should be, if we should have three BEZs, then um, where's the public support? Where is the financial support? Because you know we are, um, despite what a lot of people might think, we're not a socialist state. You know, I mean, we do have to have uh, financial realities, which is kind of you know a lot of what we're uh, facing here in the brave new world of journalism. But we and so to bring it back to the original question, Louisa, were you a good person first, or were you a writer? <laughs> I was waiting for uh, Martha to try to moderate this one. Oh, um, you, you jumped in. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Sorry. We're going to let you say the right to the second city syndrome in the first five minutes, though. <laughs> you know, uh, uh, absolutely food person first. I mean, um, and, you know, growing up in uh, um, a restaurant family and, um, you know, being a notorious eater from early on. And, um, and then somewhere at four or five learning to write, I think. You know, so, actually, food person first. So, how did you? Just as a, perhaps it would be instructive to tell people how did you? You know, how did you get into writing? Um, you know, I think that in terms of food, I mean, writing uh, in general. I actually first got into uh, for money. What's that? Writing for money. Yeah, writing for money. Yeah, that's that is the big that is the big line. Uh, I'm trying to remember when was the first time I got paid to write for write uh, about food for money, and I think that might have been, um, I think that it actually was a uh, Tribune story that I wrote about Albert Adria, the pastry chef co-owner of El Bulli. Um and that actually came about, I think, um, because I think I started blogging first, food blogging, when I was um, in Paris. I had gone to Paris to um, uh, go to culinary school, and then uh, stayed on and worked uh, as a cook there, and then while I was working there, uh, uh, got in touch with Edward Richard. So you kind of built your own platform a little bit on your own, just as a way of kind of processing what you were learning in Paris, and you know, growing. Um, do you have any idea what your readership was as a blogger? No, you know, and actually, I and I know that uh, there's um, a lot of uh, again, and, and I just threw out the you know financial card, and I have to say that. Uh, I'm very lucky in that uh, I'm not um, uh, I'm not uh, presented with numbers with my BBC blog and with my own personal blog, which is currently dormant. I I did not ever follow numbers, and um, you know, and I don't, um, and I, I kind of intentionally try to avoid that. Um, I guess I guess what I'm trying to get at is what was sort of how did you climb the ladder to get to where you are right now? You had a blog, you started really Thing for the Tribune, which is something that's you know not really available to a lot of people anymore at this point. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm interested in how people got into food writing. So, she's yeah. clearly a badass. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, go ahead. Yeah. Everybody has a completely different path. Right. That's what and I'm we always get asked, you know, were you in culinary school? Were you a journalist first? And I, if I had to pick, I would say I was a food person first. And funny enough. I grew up in a very kosher home in St. Cloud, Minnesota, where there were 10 Jewish families. 
So food was not a big deal for me as a kid. And most of my food, I think Woody Allen summarized it, it was great. I think it was in Manhattan. Um, he said his mom would put the chicken in, the, in this machine, this deflavorizing machine, it would come out the other side with no flavor. And I didn't know that was my mother. So, but I had a sister-in-law from Tasmania who got me into food. She was a huge foodie back when, before foodie was overused. And uh, when I was 13 or 14, I got introduced to pork. And it kind of was all you know, changed my life, my sister-in-law. So I became kind of a food person, excited about food, realizing that I missed out the first part of my life. And then when I got to school in Madison, you know, explored everything in, in Madison, which was a great town to do that in, and studied broadcasting. And there was no such thing as a food reporter or anybody in food back in the 90s. It was, uh, I was looking at sports, believe it or not, and there were no opportunities in sports. So I went into news and I got a job in Upper Michigan and I was a one-man band and I shot and wrote and edited all my ended live shots. And then I went to the Quad Cities in Davenport, Iowa, and Rock Island, Illinois for a while. I came to CLTV when they launched in 92 as a reporter, general assignment news reporter. But throughout this whole path, I'd been very interested in food. I remember interviewing Paul Bartolotta at Spiaggia my first year here for some event, charity event, and I was just smitten by this whole, that there could be stuff to cover in Chicago about food. In 95 was the year the Food Network launched, and that's the year that CLTV launched the Good Eating Show, which was a mirror of the Tribune's food section. And I kind of raised my hand, and I said, I would love to work on this show as a producer. We've already got a host pick. And we did that show for a year, we won a Beard Award, and then the host left, I took over as the host. And so when that started in 96, I just started calling Justin Coffin at BEC and saying, hey, you don't have anybody doing food over there, could I do a food report for you? Or calling uh, Laura Lee Shatkin at The Reader, can I do something you know, on a farmer for you guys? So I just started pitching myself as a reporter, I'll, I'll freelance for whomever just to get my byline out there. Um, and that's kind of, I think, how a lot of people do it, is you just want to accumulate clips, get to know editors, you know, turn good work in, turn it in on time, um, be responsible, professional about it. And when they canceled Good Eating in 03, I just shot myself around Chicago as a food reporter on television, and both NBC and ABC offered me part-time gigs because they saw that food was important in 2003. Um, and so, of course, my, my role has expanded at ABC as food has become more of a big deal. But I think there's no, there's no path. It's kind of the path that you set. But I think you know, all along that way, you have to be extremely passionate and extremely focused and do really good work for people um, and be consistent. Anybody else want to weigh in? Yeah, I, I think I, I was kind of the opposite in a way. Um, I didn't do anything really before I started. Um, I guess I was more of a, a writer than a food person, but I kind of got into food accidentally. I was an intern at the Reader, and, and I guess I just got in there because I passed the proofing test. I wasn't a food intern. I was doing whatever people wanted me to do. What? I, I did become the food intern, but I mean that was because Mike Sula, the food critic, was doing these food events blog posts that he didn't want to do anymore, so he passed them off on me, and I started doing them and learning the names of chefs and restaurants, so I knew a little bit about it, and our restaurant's editor let me do some short reviews, I think the first was like an ice cream place, I guess she figured I couldn't screw it up too much, and I just kind of kept doing that and did short restaurant reviews for a while. And then when we expanded the food section, I, I got hired at some point along the way. Um, but I wasn't really doing food writing. I, I was still doing the, the short blurbs, but I was hired as an editorial assistant or something like that. Um, but I just kind of stuck around there figuring that it might turn into something, which it eventually did when we expanded the food section they decided to have more columns and I got to do one of them and I mean I didn't know anything about food when I started doing it I just kind of learned as I went. So I think that's actually interesting in terms of what Amanda Esser was talking about because it seems like a lot of people um, at least up here came into this as sort of general interest writers and reporters who just were curious to see where something where this this very broad subject area we take them, I and mean, that's how I got into it. And whereas nowadays they're advocating that you become the expert first 
before you start building your writing career. Um, have any of you had, have, does that pressure come to bear on any of you? Or are you starting to feel like you need to go to culinary school or go out and kill your own pig? I mean, I know that's something that people have done. Well, I think having first person experiences like that can only really enrich what you do, obviously. And I think that in Julia's story is, is becoming increasingly rare, at least what I've seen just in my past six years of, of being a, a professional full-time food writer. Um, I think that as the level of savvy and, and passion regarding food in this country grows, there are more people who have that background in food and know that they want to spend their life writing about food. And so I think we'll probably start to see less and less people like you, in part just because of competition, who fortuitously meander their way into the area. And I think that, you know, a very interesting recent examples of a publication making the conscious choice to bring someone from outside the arena into a position of critical power would be the New York Times, looking at Frank Bruni, for example, and also Sam Sifton. But now even they're now back with Wells as their critic. Frank, Frank Bruni was a theater critic and arts reporter before he became a food Yeah, and critic Sam Sifton was the culture editor. But I mean, obviously both had had strong pensions for food. But um, what I'm seeing more and more among, among my peers, um, and it's sort of the generation below me who's getting into food, are the people who have who honed in very early on in their life on their passion for food, and they knew that they wanted to perhaps dabble in being a doer for a while, and then parlay that into being an observer, which is exactly what I did. I knew that I was passionate about food from pretty much as soon as I knew myself, um, but Know, went to liberal arts school, was a history major, it took me a little while to realize that I could actually do something about food, but instead of trying to get into publishing and writing and taking whatever path I could and then finding my way over to food, I dove into food in a hands-on way and then was able to sweet talk my way into a publication that was food focused because I had gained that knowledge and I knew the producers and the chefs and the techniques and what was happening on a national level so I could get this industry focused website to hire me, even though I didn't have a file into my name. Um, but I think that that's something that, that is becoming more and more common. Um, I, also don't, I also think these jobs become so coveted. Like when I was looking for sports jobs, those guys never left because they had a great gig. I don't think you see a lot of food writers just up and quitting because they realize, wow, I'm getting paid to do this as a profession. And it's getting harder to sort of break in, although you see interns occasionally, or Julie Kramer, who I'm proud to say I've connected with somebody at Time Out, who's done great work over there. Um, it's much tougher to break into the industry. Um, that's not wrong, but it just seems like these jobs are there are fewer, There are just fewer jobs. Yeah. Yeah. So I think in terms of critics, there should be a mandatory turnover. I really think that there should be terms. We can talk about that later. Um, I think we should. Well, that kind of that, that segues into another sort of topic.